Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Steve Huffman. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at the church. It's good to see everybody this morning. Uh, as you can tell this morning, we have the baptismal up. We have three baptisms this morning at the 8.30 service, which is going to be great. We're also streaming this service online, so that's not normal for the 8.30 crew, so you have to mind your P's and Q's this morning, right? You have to be good, right? Uh, this morning, we're going to start right into worship, so I'm going to invite you to stand. As you stand, I want to remind you that... Uh, most of you know this, worship is not about us, it's about God. And actually, uh, one of the songs that we're going to sing first, it says, where we hear praise, where we, our own ears, hear praise, God hears faith. He hears faith. Worshiping is an act of faith. It's placing our focus on God and worshiping. Just that just that act creates faith in our hearts. And in Hebrews, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And my hope, maybe it's your hope, this morning is during worship, we actually please God. So who wants to do that? So let's do that. Let's, let's pray and worship and prepare our hearts. So Father, we thank you for today. It is our hope, God, in faith to worship you to place you above everything else in our lives and actually worship you. So help us, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. There is a sound I love to hear. It's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray. Praise 
invite you to take a seat. We're going to move into a time of uh, baptisms. Here at the vineyard, if uh, someone's getting baptized, we invite them to share their testimony or their God story. And so I'm going to invite the three folks who are getting baptized to come up. And so we're going to hear just a snippet of their story about them meeting God. So the first one we have is Chase. Everybody say hi, Chase. Hi, Chase. It's Chase, everyone. Is that too high? No, that's perfect. That's perfect. All right, here we go. Here we go. Okay, don't be nervous. You got this. You got it. My life before Jesus, I was a good boy. And I would sometimes lie, but I don't do it anymore. But how I met Jesus, I would stay the night at my grandma's house. And she would take me and my sister to vineyards. And I would had a good feeling when I would go here. And how my life looks now, I am more patient, grateful, caring, setting my life more towards Jesus, loving and faithfulness. And I know more about him more than I was a then, I'm, then I was a kid, and I would always pray and still do. Great job. All right, Lexi, come on over. Everybody say hi, Lexi. Hi, Lexi. I grew up in a Christian family and seen how, how much Jesus has changed other people's lives. And when I was going through a lot, I looked to him and put it in his hands. And after that, my life got better and noticed a lot of good stuff happening. And that when I would share the gospel, I would get an amazing feeling. And when I struggle, I just give it to him and say, what should I do? And lead me to a good direction and follow him to every cent. And ever since, I have been a strong believer. My life has been amazing. I think it's amazing how much he can change a life and that he can give us faith in every situation that we do. That even during the times when you feel lonely that you can look to him and remember that Jesus loves you. Wonderful. Jaden, come on over. Everybody say hi, Jaden. Hello everyone, my name is Jaden, um, and I'm 17 years old. Some of you have seen me on this stage before, standing in front of you trying to convince you and myself that I was ready for baptism and ready to accept Christ. Most of my life I grew up in church, but I never understood what or who God was. I wanted to believe he was real, and I kept going through seasons in my life where I didn't understand if God was real, why he continued to put me through the hard seasons. Three years ago, I went through a detrimental season and lost complete faith in God. I felt as if I was stripped from my own innocence. I felt unworthy of love. At the time, I convinced myself that I was no longer worthy for God to put his time into me. One day, I decided that it was time to go back to church and give God a chance. Weeks before this, I kept feeling this feeling in my chest, but couldn't gr quite grasp what that feeling was. I walked in the doors feeling welcomed, but didn't feel like I deserved to be here worshiping and praising God. During the time of worship, I had many emotions running through my mind and my body. For the first time, I felt whole again and couldn't understand why. I felt as if God was understanding the cries coming from my heart and repairing what no one could on this earth. I remember telling myself, this is where I belong. I began craving God, craving more of his praise. I began taking the time to dig deeper in my faith. I decided it was time to walk away from the things that were pulling me away from my God. My love grew fairly quickly. I put time aside to worship in the mornings, learn the Bible at night, and pray throughout the day. He showed me that he showed me what strength was as long as I stood through him each and every day. My life changed and I learned to depend on God and his promises. A verse that I continue to follow and that is, keeps me going is from Isaiah 41.10. So do not fear, I, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for, the, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. 
I am now no longer afraid to show my faith, sit, to sit in the front row in church and sing my heart out because it's all for him. I believe that God has forgiven me and is using all of my good and bad experiences to allow me to grow into the human I was made to be. Today, I can faithfully and truthfully say I am giving my life up to Christ. He has never failed me, and I pray every day that he continues to show up in my life. He has taken all my broken pieces and made them into a masterpiece. So I'm going to invite the three of you to come over near the baptismal. Here's what's going to happen. Uh, as they walk over, a couple of staff members will get in the tank and... Uh, Each one of them will come in, and and they'll be asked three questions. They've been asked these before, but we ask them during baptism. And the questions are something like this. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world? To which they've answered before. They'll likely answer again, yes. And then we'll ask uh, them the personal question. Is Jesus Christ your personal Savior? And then we'll ask them, to the best of your ability, for the rest of your life, will you follow Jesus? And then they'll baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so as we prepare that, let's pray. So Father, we uh, thank you for stories of lives changed. It's exciting to wake up on a Sunday morning and hear the great work that you have done in these three lives. And so we celebrate this morning during baptism as heaven celebrates in Jesus' name. Amen.
darkness. You're the mighty one, the risen sun. You're the savior to the drowning. I was lost to you found me. You broke the chains that have bound me. You're the mighty one, the risen sun. You're the father to the fatherless. You're the peace in all distress. You're the light that breaks the darkness. something before she gave her life to Christ and her life was maybe a little messy and uh, I, I just felt a tug this morning that there might be uh, someone or a few people this morning where when you heard the testimonies maybe even Jaden's or someone else's that you had this realization that what you were trying to fill your life with to find joy isn't working and today is an opportunity to find Jesus that will bring the joy that you've been missing. And so I want you to just pause for a second and think about this question. Do I have a relationship with Jesus Christ? And if you can honestly answer that question, maybe not, Or you're wondering, I'm not so sure. We're going to sing just this last uh, song one more time. And I'm going to invite you to move, which means you actually have to nudge somebody and go over to Pastor Keith under the cross over here. And he will just talk to you for a few minutes about that. And so I'm going to pray. And if that's you, you should move this morning because it's an invitation to a new life with Jesus. So let, let me pray. So Father, I pray this morning if there's someone in the room that is wondering, or maybe they know they don't have a relationship with you, would you help move them? I pray that the weight that would tell them to stay put would go in the name of Jesus, and that there's freedom to move towards you this morning. So let's go back into this last song just one more time. And if this is you, you should move. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing You Reign Above It All. You reign above it all, you reign above it all. Over the universe and over every heart, there is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. Let all of heaven and the earth erupt in song. Sing hallelujah. 
might be one more person, maybe not, but might be one more person in the room you're wishing that you went over. And so there's still an opportunity to do that. I'm gonna pray to close, but uh, there'll be time over there, so, so let me pray. But if this is you, you should move while I'm praying. So Holy Spirit, we just invite your presence here again. And if anybody else is in the room, they should move right now to make room to have a relationship with you. We thank you this morning, God, for honoring people's desire to be in relationship with you, for creating space. It was an honor to worship you, to declare that you reign above everything. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks so much for worshiping this morning. Some good stuff happening over here in the corner. Here's what we're going to do. You all get 30 seconds to greet one another uh, and be super nice before we continue. So go. Be nice to one another. 30 seconds. Hey everyone, I'm Abby Hooten. And I'm Elena Clark. We're both on staff here at the Vineyard and we're so glad that you're here today. If you've not yet filled out a Connect card, you should. It's one of the best ways to get connected at the church. If you're on site, the card is in the seat back right in front of you and you can drop that off at the Welcome Center in the atrium. Or you can simply scan the QR code and fill it out electronically. Ladies, when do you feel most refreshed? Maybe it's relaxing at a spa or spending time outdoors in nature, catching up with an old friend, or maybe even just finding those still quiet moments throughout your day. When's the last time you invited God into those moments of refreshment? This weekend, I spent some time going to a couple places where I knew the Lord was working and moving. And after spending the afternoon there, I left feeling so refreshed. And it's because I intentionally spent time with the Lord and in those sweet moments with God, I always leave feeling better. Now, whether that comes easy to you or not, it may be helpful to know that God says, he will refresh the weary and satisfy the faint. And that's what we're hoping for next month's refresher. We're trusting God to refresh our souls while we set aside time to connect with God and other women through worship, teaching, a meal, and conversation. So if you relate to feeling weary or faint, you're not alone. And if that isn't you, you probably have some good practices in your life that many women would love to learn from. Either way, sign up to attend. You can do that and learn more about Refresher in the Vineyard app or stop by the Resource Center in the atrium today. Whether you have a little child or you're a young family new to the Christian faith, child dedication can be a step in building your family's spiritual legacy. At the Vineyard, child dedication is a parent's public declaration to raise their kids in a Christian home and teach them how to have a forever relationship with Jesus. So if you're interested in making that commitment, your next step is to sign up for one of two parent class options coming up in the next two weeks. There you'll receive tons of helpful tips and scriptures to help guide you in parenting, including ways to pray for your kids both now and for the future. We're about to move into our message time. So before we go, for those on site, if you've kept your cell phone on, we ask that you turn that on silent now. And if you chose to keep a child with you and they get too restless, we ask that you take them out in the atrium where you can still watch and listen to the message out by the fireplace. Thanks, Thanks Vineyard. Vineyard. My name is Mark Pope. I'm the lead pastor of the church. Good to see you. I like testimonies and baptisms. I like them. Um, before we pray for the offering, just want to say thanks for your generosity towards the church. I was just thinking yesterday of some of the things that happen around the church regularly, things that are happening kind of now. We got a team coming back from India doing a mission trip over there. 
uh, where we started a community, cent community center, help with some school things. We have a community center that operates locally. We've got this weekend, uh, Student Ministries is on a retreat, We're doing baptisms this morning. There's always, I want to say always things like that going around on the church, going around at the church. And your generosity is part of the foundation that makes all that stuff possible. So thanks for giving. And uh, let's pray for the offering. Father, we give to you, some of it's just out of pure worship. You deserve our sacrifices. Uh, we also give to you, many of us give to you, because we just want to be part of what you're doing. And uh, so we hope that our offerings are honoring to you this weekend, whether we give through the boxes or if we give electronically. Um, and as usual, I ask that you would give us as a church, as a leadership team, wisdom with all the financial decisions we need to make because we want to make the right one every time. Uh, we'd really love to do that because we want to be great stewards of your money and we want to see a ton of ministry happen. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible, uh, we're going to be in the, the Gospel of John, which is the fourth book in the New Testament. If you're new to the Bible, welcome. Glad to have you. Uh, the Bible is kind of split into two halves. There's the Old Testament, which is before Jesus came and walked on the earth. And then there's the New Testament. Uh, and the New Testament starts with four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And all of those tell the story of the life of Jesus. So we'll be in the book of John, fourth book in the New Testament. To get us started, a uh, story. Um, I have two daughters, and both of them, in the last few years, uh, got married. Here are pictures of my daughters, and they got, uh, they got married. And one of the things that I decided to do as a dad before their wedding day is I would write them or share with them kind of like a final dad love letter to my daughters before they, you know, entered into this covenant with their husbands. Seemed like a good thing to do. Uh, I can describe for you, on the right is my daughter Leah, many of you know Leah, mostly how my amazing plan worked out was the day of her wedding, I tried to tell her really important things that I had notes in front of me, but mostly I just cried. That's all that happened. I began with something like, <laughs> and so then we spent the next several minutes with her coming across the room toward me saying, are you okay? And me saying, no. And she consoled me. And then I gave her my notes and said, you should read this. So that was the first try. Oh, by the way, after the first try, my daughter Leah then, so it's a few weeks later, said, because Anna, you know, would get married someday, and she said, Dad, um, whenever you uh, do that, whatever you tried to do with me to Anna, do not do that on her wedding day was she gave me some advice. So I was more prepared for Anna, who just got married this last December, and I had every, I had a, uh, I had pretty meticulous notes, and I was emotionally ready. I'm just going to read this to her, and uh, I got almost through the whole thing, and then again, I got to the point where I was going to tell her how much I, I love her, and I bald, and she came across the room and patted me on the back and said, are you okay? And I'm like, no, I'm not okay. All right. Uh, I tell you the story to introduce a principle that I think we can all agree on. There are some things that are so important that they are destined to trigger emotion in us. There are things that are so important in our life we can't help but get emotional. So for me, it was uh, just my daughters, and I would say the same thing about my son. Uh, I cried. 
For others, it could be something even uh, as, uh, for some of us, it's God. Like when we begin to talk about God or certain things, there's an emotion that comes up. And it, it may not be a crying emotion. It may be a joyful emotion. I've seen emotion come out. Recently, we had a, a Super Bowl party here at the church. And I came to it, and I was sitting like right over here. And at one point, the big, we had the big screen down, and, and uh, one of the guys, one of the football players, took the ball, and he was running, and, and it was a good run where he was taking off and running, and the woman in front of me stood up. Nobody else was standing up. We were watching the game. She stood up, and she was like, run, run, run. <laughs> I, was like, I think the game was more important to her than some of us. For some of you, we, there's all kinds of emotions, right? Sometimes we get angry because things are important to us. Like, this is my lane, Mr. Driver. Don't get in my lane. And we get emotional about it. So we're going to shift here. Uh, most of us may know this, but this idea of important things stirring up emotion also applies to God. We have the opportunity to know and serve a God who has emotion. And every once in a while in the Bible, we will see it. So here's a couple of examples. In Mark chapter 1 from the New Living Translation, there's a man with leprosy and he kneels in front of Jesus. And in verse 41, it says that Jesus was moved with compassion. He's getting emotional about this. In the book of Numbers, chapter 11, it mentions God's anger was aroused. It says, now the people complained about their hardships, and it says his anger was aroused. Proverbs 6.16 tells us that there are six things the Lord hates. That sounds pretty strong. You might want to look that up. It actually goes on to say seven things that are detestable to him. Might want to, might want to find that list, you guys. So that's Proverbs 6.16, 6, all right? Pro, you might want to write that down. Just might help you get through the afternoon without honking God off. And in Psalm 37, and I think this qualifies in, as an emotion, in verse 13, it says the Lord laughs. Isn't that interesting? So hold those thoughts. Um, we're kicking off this series called Raw. When God gets emotional. And basically what we're going to do for the next few weeks is we're going to check out some of the uh, more noticeable moments recorded in history where we see some of the emotions of God. Now the hope in this is we're going to study this stuff so that we will know more about what is important to God. Because I think it's a safe assumption, right? Emotions follow things that are important. The other thing I, I hope, so we'll get to know who God is. It'd be good to know what God prioritizes and, prioritizes and what's important to him. The other thing is, I think we can all probably benefit by studying what is important to God because there are times we get twisted up because they should be lesser important things, but we get all emotionally involved in stuff. I am so grateful that, I get to, that I'm getting to know God more and more because there are times I'll start to get cranked up about something and then God will be like, really? And he will help me get less cranked up about lesser things. And I'm also glad because there are times I'm convinced we should probably get more emotional about certain things than we do. Today we're going to look at a section, at a story in John where Jesus weeps, which is kind of rare. And so in John 11, here's what we need to know. Jesus is well into his public ministry. He's probably a year or two into it. He's uh, developing the 12 disciples. He's teaching publicly. He's healing. In the midst of all his ministry, he's also kind of developed an extended friend group. He's got different people, different places that he knows. And in this present situation, one of his friends, his name is Lazarus, and he has a sister named Mary and Martha, so they, he knows these people, and Lazarus is getting seriously ill. 
So Mary and Martha send a messenger to Jesus and basically say, hey, Lazarus, you know him, your friend Lazarus is really, really sick and invites Jesus to come and heal him. Long story short, Jesus doesn't get there in time. And so Lazarus dies. A couple verses before the meat of where we'll land, like in verse 17, it says, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for, for four days. Now, something I don't know is how many days before they put him in the tomb, just so you know. Maybe it was right away. But anyway, he's at least four days late. Verse 21 then says, Martha said to Jesus, this is one of Lazarus' sisters, she says to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus goes on from there, and he is now going to uh, be with Mary and a group of other people with Mary, and they are crying over the death of Lazarus. So we'll pick it up in verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping, that's Mary, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled where have you laid him he asked come and see lord they replied and then verse 35 is actually i believe the shortest verse in the whole bible you guys ready jesus wept then the jews said see how he loved him but some of them said could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying couple more verses. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe... You will see the glory of God. And to finish the story, Jesus raised this man out of that tomb, out of the grave. Uh, title of the talk is Jesus Weeps. And I want to explore the question, what's he crying about? Like, what stirred him so much? What, why did he get emotional in this situation? So let me pray, give you some ideas. Father, pray for today. I pray for the next six weeks that you would expand our understanding of things that you're passionate about and that those things would affect us. I do confess, Lord, that I'm not sure. Uh, no, that's not right. I'm pretty sure, Lord, we could use some help prioritizing the most important things. So in the next few weeks, would you help us make, learn more about your priorities so that our priorities might be more aligned? And I also, I'm sorry, sorry folks, I'm just praying for a while because I just feel like I should pray for a minute. So. <laughs> God, we're kind of messed up emotionally in our culture. We could use some help knowing when to have more joy, knowing how to have joy, knowing what things are worth crying about. And so we just confess our need for you to be our teacher and our developer. Make us more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, a couple things today. Are you ready? A couple things you can write down. Anybody, anybody ready? Just need one person to respond. I appreciate it. Here's the first thing. Jesus cried about others' emotional pain. Others, what we're going to call emotional pain. I don't think this point will be too hard to follow. Emotional pain. Verse 33, Jesus saw her weeping, I think that was Mary, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, and then it says he was deeply moved in spirit and trouble. So I think what happened here was, of course, he, well, he sees Mary, 
And he likes Mary. Mary's a friend. And so she's, she's crying. And then he looks around, and then there's more people crying. And have you ever been part of a cry fest where, like, someone's crying, and then someone else cries, and all of a sudden you feel like you're going to cry because crying seems to be the thing to do. So some of this is happening in Jesus, which makes sense to us. Have you, have you done it? I was recently, uh, oh, <clears throat> during the baptisms this morning, testimony and baptisms, uh, when one of them was sharing the testimony, I think it was Jaden, I'm over there going, oh, oh, because oh, I'm, I'm again, I hope, hope nobody starts crying in here because I'm about ready to bust out crying. Have you ever made the I'm almost crying sound where you try not to cry and then it starts to come out cry? I was at a, <clears throat> at a movie recently, uh, and I'm going to promote this movie. It's called Jesus Revolution, and it's a story about when God was doing some great things. And so I'm at this movie, and there were some testimonies in the movie. And I'm sitting there, and someone was talking about how much, you know, Jesus has changed their life. And I don't know why. I start tearing up in the movie theater, and I'm like, oh, no, here we go. And I actually made a sound in the movie theater, almost crying. Uh, uh. And then, you know, you're stuffing it all in. <clears throat> so somewhere in there, Jesus has got all this going on, and Mary's crying, and the Jews are crying. It is, I just thought of this last night when I was thinking about it. And Jesus just goes ahead. Like he, I'm sure he had the capacity and the power to stuff it, but he didn't. He just cried along with them. Just so you know, this compassionate connection to people who are hurting emotionally, it's part of who God is. Some Bible verses. In Psalm 34, it says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Goes on to say, And saves those who are crushed in spirit. In Mark chapter 1, we already looked at this. There's a man with leprosy. By the way, leprosy, horrible disease. Won't go into all the physical things. Would it, affect the, it would have affected this man physically and socially because you couldn't live with a whole bunch of people if you had this skin disease. So he comes to Jesus and he kneels in front of him. This guy's hurting, right? And it moves Jesus. Another story to explore in Luke chapter 7. Uh, what's going on here is one of the Pharisees invites Jesus to have dinner with him. So pretty much it's going to be a pretty, I'm thinking, it's going to be a fairly pretty people dinner party. Pharisees were pretty well off. They had structures in their lives. Uh, um, uh, they would have been recognized in the community. So in this place, there were probably quite a few people, people who had it, to get had it together at least on the outside so into this setting in verse 37 it says a woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that jesus was eating at the pharisee's house so she wasn't invited guest an invited guest she sneaks in and in verse 38, it says, as she stood behind him, that's Jesus, at his feet, weeping. Everybody say weeping. Weeping. She's the only one in the room weeping. She's not trying to keep it together. And then she began to wet his feet with her tears. Now, this is my take on this situation. You got a large group of pretty people versus one broken person. By the way, side note, if you live, it says she's lived a sinful life. There are consequences, hopefully we can admit this, there are consequences for a sinful life, especially, can I talk about lifestyle? If you live, most of us, maybe some of us have seasons where we lived far from God in the midst of sin. Things get ugly in a sinful lifestyle. They, I mean, we try, we think, oh, no, this is going to be good. But repeated sin increases pain in our life. If you've ever been in the midst of sexual immorality where you're like, oh, no, this seems, sin lies a lot. It says, this is going to be a riot. 
And it may be a lot of fun for a little while, but over a time, the accumulation of sinful activities ends up creating pain. You think, well, I thought this would be a good idea, but now that I've, you know, done this thing 40 times, I just hurt in here. Does that make, does that make sense? It, it's the same way with, it's not just like sexual immorality, but greed, man, you go after it and you go after it and go after it. Eventually what comes is, is that I thought that this would work. This is not working. Does that make sense? So this woman had lived a sinful life and now she's there and all the pain is coming out. What I notice about the text is, if you read the rest of the story, Jesus connects and has more affinity for this woman than all of the pretty people in the room. In Matthew 9, Jesus says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And Jesus is the doctor. So you can write this in. It's a, it's a theological principle. God is drawn to people in pain. So how do you apply this concept into our lives? I've got three questions that might help. The first one is this. Am I sharing my pain? And I'm ta not talking about sharing it with other people. Sometimes I think that's appropriate. Am I sharing my pain with God? And I'll just make this really quick. Don't fake it with God. God is not impressed when we suck it up and act like we're good. When the Lord says, do you need anything? No way. I'm good, God. Even, does that make sense? That is, the, that is not wise. Because, and actually we could probably build a case. When we come to the Lord and go, no, I'm good. I got it. I'm good. I'm good. good. God says, okay, good luck with that. Have it. Okay. Because he has affinity, leans into people who understand and confess their and confess their need. Don't fake it with God. You can fake it with other people some. That's okay. So am I sharing my pain with God? Second question, am I noticing others' pain? This is for those of us who we're trying to be like Christ in the world. We're trying to make a difference in the world. I think it's easy to be drawn to people who have it kind of put together, but don't forget to regularly understand or acknowledge that person's hurting. I should probably take care of them, care about them, because that's what Jesus would do, would do if he's in the room. Galatians 6, 2 says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So pause right now. Is there somebody in your life that's in pain? Emotional pain. Try to do something for them today. Just be aware. And I, I, I made a note here, and it may have been the Lord prompting me. Some of you are doing so well. Just keep caring. Keep caring. Don't let your heart get hard toward people in pain. Keep on caring. Okay. Uh, the last question to finish up this point is, am I promoting God to those in pain? Am I promoting God? This is just an evangelistic question. Don't forget, many, many, many people, I would probably argue most people, come to Christ in the midst of some pain or discomfort, and then someone says, have you thought about Jesus? Have you brought God into that circumstance? Can I invite you to my small group, to our church? God is, right? We should be helpful, but, but God forbid we just help, help, help and never get them to the Savior because the Savior's the one who can really help. Just a reminder, if someone's hurting, it's a great open door to say, have you considered Jesus Christ? Can I pray for you? Those kind of things. So the first idea is Jesus cried about others' emotional pain. One more. Jesus cried about people doubting his heart doubting his heart. Now, you might have to work a little bit to 
uh, stay with me on this point. When I talk about his heart, I'm talking about his motives or whether he cared. So let me give you a word picture, then we'll get back to the text. I have a, um, I have had for years a prepared parental speech for my children that I never got to use. But I have, I have daydreamed about the day that this would happen. I never got to use this speech, so maybe you can use it someday. This, it was going to happen something like this. I imagined one of my kids coming to me, my teenager or so, coming and say, Dad, you never cared. I just, because maybe I saw it in a movie or something, and I thought one of these days they're going to come and they're going to go, you never loved me. You never cared. Ready? You want to hear my speech? Don't you ever accuse me of not caring about you. I brought you home from the hospital. I changed your poopy diapers. I prayed for you virtually every stinking day of your life. I've sacrificed, we, my wife and I, tens of thousands of dollars for you and your education and your clothes. That's the speech. You can say a lot of things about your dad, but don't ever accuse me of not caring about you. That's my speech. Prepare that. Get it? Now, wait, wait. Yeah. I don't think I'll ever get to use it. Probably now that I've done that, one of them will come to me and go, Dad, you never cared. Be, bang! Now, why did I share that? Because the idea of telling me that I have not cared or accusing me is offensive to me because have I, have I been perfect at those things? No. But that, uh uh uh. So if we get back to the, the text, pay attention here. So in verse 36, it says, The Jews said, they're talking about Jesus, see how he loved him. But some of them, there's this group of people, they say this, could. Not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying. Now, this is my interpretation of this. They're going, don't you think he should have? I don't think he really cared. He's this miracle working guy. Apparently, he really didn't care enough about Lazarus to show up. Now, right after they say this, it's the next verse, and here's what it says. Jesus, right, wants more deeply moved. This, this is my hurt, this is my interpretation. This gets into Jesus' emotions. And if you explore that word, Jesus does not become, he's not about to cry. He doesn't get sad. This once more deeply moved, we'll put the, tra the definition up on the screen. Look at what it, this is what's going on in, <laughs> in Jesus' soul. It's to be moved with anger. It's to admonish sternly. It's to express displeasure. And literally, it means to snort like an angry horse. He is honked off inside. So this next one is a fill in the blank. I don't think it's perfect. But it's, it's something like this. Jesus does not like to be accused of failing or being unloving or not caring. By the way, Jesus has, could have a prepared speech, right? Son of God. He could say, I left heaven. I've been traveling around in this human body. I've been serving people day and night for the last year and a half. I've been staying holy my whole existence so that I can die on a cross for your sin. I've healed thousands of people now. Don't you be standing off to the side questioning whether I care or not. I think he's offended. And just to add to this, if you can hang in there, Jesus then does what I would call one of the most flamboyant miracles in the New Testament. So let's dive in to the rest of the story. Jesus then, it's after this, he gets all cranked up and, it says, and he says, take, take away the stone. And they say, I don't think that's a good idea. It's going to smell. It's been in there four days. And he says, take away the stone. 
And then in verse 43, this is unique, because most of the time when Jesus would do miracles, some of you know this, he would tend to do them quietly. If someone was sick, he would go there. There are times he would go into a person's room. He would keep everybody else outside. He didn't, he could have, you know, been all big. And, but most of the time, and sometimes he would even say to someone when he'd healed them, he would say, I healed you. Don't tell anybody. He tended to be a quiet miracle worker, but not today, not in this context, because it says in verse something right there, it says, Jesus, right? He, they take the stone away. He doesn't go into the tomb. He stands out there and he yells. He cries out. He called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. I mean, you know, everybody's watching, right? They're all looking at the hole in the rock thinking, are you kidding me? Then Jesus comes. I'm sorry, then Lazarus, right, comes walking out. Take some time and think about what that'd be like. Lazarus, like, holy, like, what in the, where, like, I don't, wouldn't that be crazy? Okay, never mind. It's just fun for me to think about. I thought this down. I thought, I thought about this. I wrote it down. Not a fill in the blank. But Jesus responded to the skeptics by showing off. Maybe. A little bit. He didn't like it when people were off to the side accusing him of failing at caring. At... So how do we wrap this talk up? Just a couple things to close. This is just some advice. First one is be cautious about accusing God. We would be wise. I think it's okay to question and wonder but we should be cautious about accusing God of not caring. By the way, if God does nothing for me the rest of my life, he has already proved his love for us when he sent his son to die on a cross and to raise from the grave, okay? He, he doesn't have to do anything else for us. Chances are he will. He doesn't have to. Let's be cautious about accusing God. And then with this whole picture in mind, this whole story, we should still be eager to bring him your brokenness. We should bring him our brokenness. There's a whole other point in this talk that I'm just going to hit. Just a reminder, this last picture of Jesus, he raised a guy from the dead, the guy's heart hadn't been hadn't beated in at least four days. How much rigor mortis is in that body? The decay process has already started. There is nothing that Jesus can't speak to. You can think, well, this is dead. Oh, there's no way that's coming back to life. Oh, there's no hope in this situation. I would say. Wrong. Wrong. Because of who Jesus Christ is. He can speak to dead things. Dead, cold, hopeless things. And those things can come back to life. So it's just a good reminder for us. So if you've got something that's dead-ish. You think, oh, this is dead. Oh, my, my emotional life, it's dead. I'm just going to be sad the rest of my life. Uh-uh, uh-uh. You know, my, my relationships, no way. I haven't, uh-uh. We consistently get in the presence of God. Things come to life. Why don't you stand and we'll close?